All right, so in this last lesson of module 13, we're going to look at some of the religious reformers. And in the last lesson, we really looked at some of the crisis that broke out in the church in the late Middle Ages. And we're going to continue to look along that theme of religious reform by studying some of the reformers in the late Middle Ages and what specific changes they wanted to make to the practice of Christianity. The late medieval reformers, uh, one of the biggest ones was an Englishman by the name of John Wycliffe. Now, um, John Wycliffe is alive during the time of the Avignon Papacy. And um, when the Pope moved to Avignon away from Rome, so he's alive during the beginning part of the Western Schism when the church is split and there's two different uh, rival popes, each claiming to be the leader of Roman Catholicism. John Wycliffe is reacting to these kinds of changes and he's also lived through it the time period of the Black Death. So he's seen the terrible devastation that has come about, the incredible loss of life from the Black Death. And so all of these things are coming together to encourage him to look for ways to reform Christianity so that the popes and the other church officials are really going to live up, he wants them to live up to what the Bible has to say that Christians should be living their lives as. So some of the reforms that he wanted to put into action are as follows. First, Wycliffe begins to preach that in order to be saved, you don't need to go to a priest. Instead, you can confess your sins directly to God. Now, he's not saying that we don't need priests or that we should get rid of priests. He still thought that priests were important for teaching and preaching the gospel. But he basically said that every person can have access to God on their own. They don't need to go through the church for salvation. In other words, what he's kind of going against is the idea raised by Pope Gregory back in the high Middle Ages and raised again by Pope Boniface and the Unum Sanctum that outside the church there is no salvation. Or in other words, you have to be a member of the Roman Catholic Church in order to go to heaven. And he's saying, no, as long as you confess your sins directly to God, that's what you need to do to be saved. He also goes further to state that he believes that religious leaders should not hold political positions. Now, remember that the church is part of the feudal system that we've talked about in the lessons on the high Middle Ages. Sometimes it's a bishop that's serving as a vassal to the king, and that bishop or archbishop is receiving lands in exchange for loyalty and other kinds of services to the king. And there was, this would make those bishops and archbishops very powerful within the government. But Wycliffe, he said that religious leaders should be focused really on their spiritual duties and not worry about politics. And so he's calling here for the kind of early separation of church and state. He wants religious leaders to pro focus on preaching the gospel and on living godly Christian lives and not to be concerned with you know, temporal power and politics of the world. He also the, then goes on to say that the Bible should come, become the ultimate authority for all Christians. And this is a direct challenge to the authority of the Pope. In the high Middle Ages, the popes are suggesting that they are the ones who are the ultimate authority when it comes to theological matters, and that they are and have been chosen by God, and God speaks through them. And when they become God's representatives here on earth, but Wycliffe removes the human element and instead raises the Bible as God's representative on earth. He says that the Bible should be the ultimate authority to Christians' life. This means that people should be able to read and understand the Bible in their own language. Now, in the Middle Ages, the Bible's written in Latin, and it's spoken in Latin within the church. So again, a lot of people can't read at this time, but the issue is that because the Bible's in Latin, even if somebody reads the Bible to them, many individuals won't even be able to understand it because they don't understand Latin. So Wycliffe says we need to translate the Bible into the languages that people actually speak. And that way, if somebody is able to read it to them, they would be able to hear it and understand it. And so this kind of begins the process of translating the Bible from Latin to English, which is his native language. And he's, going, he's doing this so that more people in England can read and understand the Bible and then follow it. And this way, they won't need to rely on the church for interpretations. They'll be able to read and interpret the Bible for themselves. The last thing that we say is that Wycliffe attacked various church practices and behaviors that he thought did not really help people live spiritually godly lives. For one thing, he disapproved of the sale of indulgences. And we talked about a little bit about that during the Crusades, but there were kind of proclamations you could get from the church stating that you wouldn't have to spend a certain number of years in purgatory. Instead, you could go straight to heaven. And during the period of the Crusades, going on crusade was considered to be an act of penance. And if you were doing that, then in return for that act of penance, you were receiving an indulgence. But over time, we start to see the removal of the need to do an act of penance and instead just give money or do charity. 
towards the church, and that would be considered an act of penance. But for Wycliffe, he sees the sale of indulgences as coming too close to the idea that you can buy your way into heaven. So he really disapproves of that practice. He also disapproved of the practice of clerical celibacy. He said that one of the major reasons that priests were having illegitimate children is because they were told, you're not allowed to get married. And so Wycliffe, he says instead of encouraging the priest to sin by going out and having a mistress and violating their vows of clerical celibacy, just let the priest get married and have children like everybody else does. And so he's a proponent of allowing, allowing priests to get married instead of having to remain celibate. He saw this as a means of helping monks from committing sins. Another thing that he disapproved of was pilgrimages. A lot of people would go on a pilgrimage in the hopes that it would heal them or that they'd be able to gain an indulgence. And for Wycliffe, these pilgrimages tended to attract a poor individual um, because, or, you know, it costs money to be able to go and see the relics of the church, uh, and the churches would ask you to give a donation. And so Wycliffe, he says, you know, uh, this would be much better if people would just stay at home and kind of take care of themselves instead of going on this pilgrimage and kind of wasting money. But of course, uh, this would be an attack or interpreted as an attack against the church, and many churches would rely upon that income that they were receiving from these pilgrimages. So you can kind of see how Wycliffe is going to make himself an annoyance to the church leaders. Because he's saying, you know, the church is not uh, required for salvation. The leaders shouldn't be connected to politics. That the Bible, not the Pope, is the ultimate authority. He's disapproving of these very common practices that are taking place during his time. And he starts to publish his ideas. The Pope gets very upset and wants John Wycliffe to come uh, and basically be put on trial for his ideas. But John Wycliffe is protected by some very powerful English noblemen. And they protect him and they do not let the Pope get his hands on Wycliffe. So Wycliffe will die in 1384 and be buried in England. But what's kind of interesting is that in the year 1415 at the Council of Constance, the council meeting that we talked about in the previous lesson, the issue of John Wycliffe's ideas come up at this church council, and Wycliffe is declared a heretic. Now the penalty for heresy is being burned alive at the stake, but Wycliffe is already dead. So what do they do? They dig up his bones and burn his bones. They say, well, he's a heretic. You have to burn him, but he's already dead. Well, we'll just burn his dead body. And you can kind of see, you know, how his ideas are obviously not very uh, well accepted by those who are in leadership in the church. Now, while John Wycliffe is publishing his ideas, they do spread very quickly and widely. And one of the individuals who agrees with John Wycliffe was another reformer in the late Middle Ages named Jan Hus. So Jan Hus is from the Kingdom of Bohemia, which is no longer in existence. Most of the kingdom is now in the modern-day Czech Republic. And he agrees with Wycliffe on the idea that people can confess their sins directly to God, but also the idea that the Bible is the ultimate authority in a Christian's life. And so when Wycliffe was translating the Bible into English, Jan Hus goes to translate the Bible into Czech, which is the language that his people spoke. And so he was in agreement with Wycliffe on this. However, he also had other criticisms of church practices besides the criticisms that Wycliffe had raised. John Hughes uh, did not like the way communion was being practiced during the Middle Ages. And during the Middle Ages, if you were to take communion, or sometimes you might call it the Lord's Supper or the Eucharist, if you were a lay person, you are just an ordinary Christian, not a priest or a monk or a nun. You would only get the bread when you took communion. But if you were someone who was part of the church, you would get both the bread and the wine. And this is kind of the idea behind this. This difference in practice was that people of the church didn't want ordinary Christians coming to church just to get some wine, just to get some alcohol. But if you have one group of people in your church that gets to take the bread uh, and the wine, and you have another group that only gets to take the bread, it kind of looks like one group is better than the other. And so Jan Hus starts to argue that every Christian should be able to take communion in both kinds, that they should have both access to the bread and the wine. Because the communion ceremony was not simply to remind us about the death of Jesus, but it was a sign that we are one in Jesus, that we're equally spiritual. Um, and so um, for him having a different you know, ceremony done in a different way was not biblically based. And so he starts to proclaim that communion should be served in two kinds to everyone. So Jan Hus is younger than John Wycliffe, and so he is alive when the Council of Constance meets. The bishops invite Jan, 
to come before the conference and present his ideas. He's guaranteed safe passage to that meeting. And so he goes to the meeting, expect that they will be able to engage in some debate about his ideas and come to a kind of conclusion. However, when he arrives, instead of debate, he's immediately arrested, put on trial, and convicted of heresy at the council meeting. And as we said, the penalty for heresy is being burned alive at the stake. And so that's what they do. They burn John Hoos at the stake. And, um, you know, they light the fire. And you can see in this picture that it's just before they light. And he's wearing this hat. Uh, this is known as a heretic's hat. It's a funny little symbol on it that um, is the symbol of heresy. And so he's declared to be a heretic. They burn him alive at the stake and obviously do not live up to the agreement of safe passage. Even after their deaths, John Wycliffe and Jan Hus would have a very big impact on Christianity in Western Europe. And this is because they both had groups of followers that would continue to spread their ideas and keep them alive. Um, the Lollards spent, uh, spread uh, Wycliffe's ideas all throughout England. Um, and so, um, and basically, uh, they go around preaching his ideas, even though they hadn't been ordained as preachers in the church, so his enemies are calling his followers uh, lawlers or mumblers because they're trying to make fun of them because they're not well-educated and that they're doing all this preaching, but they're spreading his ideas. Um, they're hiding copies of the Bible that have been translated into English. They're cir circulating them secretly in England. And so they're keeping those ideas alive and helping them spread to other areas. In fact, um, it's probably because of the Lollards and Jan Hus uh, contact with him that that's probably how he's um, you know, knowing about Wycliffe's ideas. Now, Jan Hus has followers as well back in Bohemia, and when they learn that Jan Hus has been killed, that the bishops have not abided by the agreement of safe passage, his follow followers start an uprising, and they start to take over church property, and they seize it, and they camp out on it, and they kick the church officials out of their own property, and this starts a war back in Bohemia known as the uh, Husite War. And the followers of John Hus uh, start squaring off against mercenaries from the church uh, that the church hires. These mercenaries uh, fight against them, and um, they also it also contacts the Holy Roman Emperor and gets the Holy Roman Emperor to send German troops to help fight. So this war, as you'll notice, I mean, it lasts for well over a decade, and finally the two sides do agree to make peace, and according to the peace terms, the church agrees to allow the Hussites to have communion in two kinds. They can have both the bread and the wine, and in return... Uh, they're going to agree to return the property that they had seized back to the church and so that the war would come to an end. But you see how people were inspired by Hughes and his death. Now, the longer-term impact of Wycliffe and those and the other late reformers are going to be, you know, that they're going to be reading their ideas and heavily influencing them. And probably the most famous uh, individual who's reading Wycliffe and who is going to be Martin Luther. And it's going to be Martin Luther who begins the Protestant Reformation. So in many ways, you could say that Wycliffe and and Hughes are laying the foundation for the Protestant Reformation of the 16th century. And if we look into this, and it's making the claim in a very visual way, you can see this woodcut in the 15th or 16th century that we have um, John Wycliffe on the left. Um, he's making sparks with flint, and you can see that John Hughes is lighting a small torch with the sparks that Wycliffe is making and passing that torch to Martin Luther. And we can kind of see this progression. So these late medieval reformers would ultimately be laying the foundation for that reformation, which we will talk about in the next module and series of lessons. And that brings us to an end of module 13.